Have you got yourself a little guard dog in town? Is your papillon driving you mad, barking at all of the neighbours? Is your German Shepherd joining the noise police, telling everybody off for the slightest sound? Stick with me, dog lovers. This video is definitely for you. So welcome, I'm Emma. Today I'm going to talk to you about all things territory. So many of us don't think about our barky dogs being particularly territorial, even though we sometimes use other words for it, like guard dog or watchdog. So times have really changed. So back in the 1970s when I grew up, our first spaniel was called Ticker, and I swear this is the lamest dad joke that ever happened. My dad said we called her Ticker because she was a watchdog. As we move away from rural life and from cringeworthy dad jokes, it's easy to forget that dogs have played a role in our lives as guard dogs for thousands of years. And this is the original Beware of the Dog sign here from the house of the tragic poet, whose name I love, in Pompeii. So Cave Canem was the little motto that was engraved on this mosaic, Beware of the Dog. Even before that, small statuettes of dogs have been buried in the foundations of buildings, especially near doorways or placed into the lintels. So these clay dogs here were found at Nimrod and they were buried beneath the entranceway to the home and they're probably a charm to ward off evil. So my favourite of these they were found at the city of Kish, where they've been inscribed with various names like one of my favourites, which is Biter of the Enemy. As we move further into urban modern life, it's easy to forget that dogs have occupied this role for thousands of years, maybe even 3,000 years, maybe 4,000, where alerting us to intruders is one reason that they were left to wander around walled cities at night, for instance. That was perhaps one of the most useful roles that dogs played in our lives. So their role as an early warning system, if you like, for attacks by rivals under cover of dark is how Sherlock Holmes deduced that the intruder was known to the home in The Adventure of Silver Blaze by Arthur Conan Doyle. So the dog that didn't bark in the night clearly knew the thief, which is an easy deduction for a detective such as Sherlock Holmes to make, and he understood the function that dogs have played in our lives. To truly understand canine behaviour, it's really useful to take a step back and think of animals in general before drilling down on canids and then on dogs themselves. So although many animals inhabit distinct territories most of them are not actually territorial to be territorial means that you actively defend your territories from intruders and robins are one example of territorial animals actively protecting an area up to about half a hectare in size funnily enough about the same size that dogs do their red breast triggers territorial behavior in other robins and robins have been known to attack stuffed robins marked with their typical red breast so intruders on the land and I had a running war once with a blue tit, seriously, who spent most of his time attacking our car window, um, the car wing mirrors. And in the end, I gave up. He was not the one who gave up, although he can't have been a very doting partner. Uh, I gave up and put a large pair of socks over the wing mirror every time I parked up during the birds mating season. I really seriously don't think Mr. Blue Tit got it on and I don't think his progeny will be living to be so territorial. Territorial behaviour is usually related to the density of food and to mating opportunities. So of course our cocker spaniels don't have to fight off the neighbour's Airedale to keep our fridges safe and our canicorsos don't have to worry about keeping next door's whippet away from their girlfriend. So perhaps it's because of this that it makes little sense for dogs to be territorial that many of us forget that they actually can be. When thinking about dogs it's also important to think about the canid family in which dogs belong. So in his books about wolves, researcher Rick McIntyre makes it clear that the biggest cause of death for adult wolves is being killed by rivals. So to enter the territory of a rival family is to risk death. We also see from the GPS tracker information from Voyageurs National Park how wolves largely stick to clear territories with occasional forays into the neighbouring territories. So you can see that data here, I love this. So although there are some natural barriers like rivers or ravines, you could have marked these territories out with a ruler, couldn't you, on the whole? Incursions into neighbouring territory are incredibly infrequent. So wolves are not a fusion fission species. They don't come together as a larger group and then dissipate as humans and apes do in the same way. And even when wolves sleep, relatively spread out as usual, when they wake up, there are re-greeting rituals. And you may have actually noticed this with your own dogs. Even naps are often followed by ritual greetings. It's like, hello, we're all awake again. So we're going to 
you'll find on my Facebook page a clip from Wolves in Yellowstone National Park as they wake up and they refuse together. And I'm sure you'll notice lots of those similar behaviours in their own dogs, despite the fact, you know, that these wolves haven't been more than metres away from each other while they slept. So we generally tend to see lots of muzzle greetings, lots of stretching, low, loose, wagging tails, yawning, investigation of various, uh, various bits. And rituals like these are the ways that wolves manage fusion even after a short nap within their own group. But this shouldn't be news to us. So our nearest relatives, they also live in social groups and they engage in similar greeting behaviour when the group comes back together. Um, each group has got a codified way of greeting that can depend and can differ depending on their culture. Of course, you knew I meant to show you bonobos and chimps, right? So in many ways, we've selected dogs in our own image. We are also territorial as a chimpanzees. I don't see very much difference between this and this. So if you have a regiment lined up to protect your jewels, you have fences, locks, doors, CTTV, burglar alarms, dash cams, if you've got a dog, if you've ever twitched your curtains, have a look at the noise outside, then I think it makes it a bit easier to understand that dogs might also struggle with intruders too. So of course we know that dogs are not wolves and it's unlikely most dogs will fight to the death over territory. There have been huge changes to the way in which dogs form groups in which became domesticated and the whole structure of canine life is different for dogs than it is for wolves. Dogs are much more pro-social but they're also not bound in the same way by family bonds. So what do we know about territorial behaviour in dogs? We actually know surprisingly very little. So firstly, most dogs in our lives live very restricted lives and have very little choice about where they're permitted to go. So only in looking at dogs who live unrestricted lives can we get a sense of where they actually go. So perhaps unsurprisingly, this is not very interesting for researchers and it can be hard to get funding. So studies that have looked at where free roaming dogs go have largely looked at this in terms of disease vectors like the spread of rabies or whether dogs impact on other animal life if they're allowed to roam. And of course, you can imagine that most of the data has found that dogs, when they're left to their own devices, go and find themselves some food. Nevertheless, there has been some research. So there have been studies of street and village dog life in India, for example. There are also studies about free, ro free roaming owned dogs in Baltimore from the 1970s, as well as studies about free roaming owned dogs in Chile and Sao Paulo in other countries in South America as well. We've also got data from Australia about the size of free roaming owned farm dogs territories and the size of their home range, as well as their behaviour and how they move about. So from this research we can see that dogs do have a territory where they spend some of the time and a home range where they spend most of their time. So this one is taken from the work of um, Beck from the 1970s set in Baltimore and looking at where stray dogs roamed and you, here you can see the home range of Shaggy and Doberman, uh, interesting names there, and you can see the little tiny dots on there where he actually came, encountered those dogs when he was watching them. And then you can also see the shaded area where they spent most of the time resting and so on. So they're not very much like the littlest hobo of my 1970s childhood. Neither though do they spend all of the time on their own. So dogs may have small social groups, particularly if they live outside human, human guardianship completely. So these social groups are relatively fixed, although dogs come and go, and they may act in the same way that wolf groups do, that there's safety in numbers. So thus a group can keep a single intruder away better than an individual could. But when Alan Beck conducted his research on free roaming dogs in Baltimore in the 1970s, he found that most of the dogs that he saw were singles with occasional pairs who stayed together. Few groups were bigger than four or five. And what he saw in comparison to the wolves was that they, much like humans, do have fusion and fission on a more regular basis than wolves would. So we've thought about wolves, we've thought about street dogs and village dogs who are entirely responsible for their own reproduction and their own selection. But what does this mean for those who have been selected for behaviours, for our domesticated dogs, our entirely restricted dogs who live behind gates and doors? 
Honestly, we don't really know. There's so little research that's taken place into how restricted dogs behave in, in completely restricted environments or the interplay of those years of selection for behaviour prior to Victorian kennel clubs who prioritised consistency of looks rather than consistency of behaviour. What we do know is that livestock guardian dogs who spend their time in open pastures in northern Italy, the Maremma or southern France like the Grand Pyrenees, they're bonded to the flock rather than bonded to the land. So in other words, for some dogs who've been selectively bred for millennia for behaviour, territory is not the important thing, the family group is. But on the other hand, continental shepherds on the northern European plains that stretch through France, Holland, Belgium, into Germany and then Poland, Hungary, right all the way over into Ukraine, these dogs have been selected differently. So uh, unlike the open pastures and natural predators of the Pyrenees and the Southern Alps, Northern Europe is crowded. The fields are not enclosed on the whole as they are in the UK and smaller flocks are regularly moved from field to field where the dogs have been selected to guard the flock, but also to keep the flock together. And the sheep on these Northern European plains are not hefted to the land as they are in Wales or the lakes or the border. So there, the sheep have got a stronger sense of territory. They're not territorial, but they have a stronger sense of territory. Unlike the sheep of Northern Europe, who are pretty used to being moved around regularly, even day by day, and for the dogs to actually keep them together as a flock. So we use these Northern European shepherd dogs regularly in military roles to guard bases and patrol sites, just as we use these dogs across the world to guard our homes. So who knows how dogs such as these interpret territory? And where does that leave our other dogs, our Huskies, Malamutes, our Shelties, our Collies, our Sharpe, our Chows, our Akitas? We simply don't know through research. What I'm mostly loving as I'm doing this video, I can hear quite a lot of territorial barking going on in the background. But what we do know from the dogs in front of us is that some dogs, particularly maybe the ones who live near me, have got a very strong sense of home ground. It just bears thinking about as well that we don't even know how the number of dogs in a particular area has also affected how dogs behave. We don't know about population density, for example, and whether that causes dogs to feel more stressed as it would do, say, for instance, if robins were forced to live in close confines with a lot of other robins. So what we do know is from what we see in the behaviour of the dogs who are in front of us and that we know that some dogs have got a very strong sense of home ground. So take my beautiful boy here, Heston. He's a very typical rural French shepherd cross. What you would typically think of as a shepherd dog. No particular lineage, not particularly well selected in terms of breeding, has very strong behaviours. He doesn't meet very many people like many rural dogs and so he's a bit shy at first and then he's totally in love with you. Um, so if we meet people out on walks or if I take pl him places, he tends to shyness or nervous barking if people approach too quickly. He'd much rather move away than move in. So even, for instance, when I've taken my dog to, say, for instance, social events, barbecues and things like that, where there's a lot of other dogs and people, um, where, for, for instance, my little spaniel would have been right there, right at the bottom of the barbecue, waiting for things to drop off the barbecue into her mouth. Heston tends to stay away from the people as it is, although he can be tempted in from time to time for food. So we're not talking about a dog who really hates people. It can be reactive on walks if he sees someone by surprise. But at home, it's a very different story. So as my French neighbours would say, I'm very well guarded. So during the day, he was on duty. He'd sit in doorways, as you see here, and my other shepherds, uh, in vantage points, watching the world go by, and heaven help you if you got onto the property. It would very much be a case that you might be able to get on, but you may not be able to get off again. So Heston is a Belgian Shepherd mix with a little bit of German Shepherd, a little bit of Spaniel, a little bit of Labrador, typical French rural dog, apart from the Gronendale, which is a little bit less common in France. So although they're not known as much as the Malinois, for instance, as for protection work, we should remember that for all intents and purposes, the four Belgian Shepherds are the same breed of dog, just with different coats. And yes, when we've had intruders, we've seen behaviours not unlike in this little clip here that would have suggested, you know, he'd been trained for protection sports, certainly not biting people, grabbing them, uh, but pinning people in location by barking at them, just as dogs do in protection sports, ring sports trials like this dog here, 
a Gronendale at his very best, um, is exactly what Heston would do. So one time when uh, a certain gentleman got onto the property who shouldn't have been there, saying he was looking for scrap metal, of course, um, Heston kind of pinned him in a corner, stood there barking at him, just exactly like this dog is doing with this uh, this person in a bite suit in the blind. And you would have thought, trained protection dog, no training whatsoever. And we also need to understand the role that genetics plays. So in the 1950s and 60s, John Paul Scott and John Fuller raised lines of five breeds of dog in order to study the genetics of behaviour. American Cocker Spaniels were among those five. So what they found was that some behaviours, probably not the big ones, and certainly not the ones we don't think about, are heritable. So one of the little curiosities of their immense body of work was that barking is heritable in two different ways. So there were two different aspects of barking that could be inherited. One was how quickly it took the dogs to bark in response to seeing a strange person. So some dogs bark more quickly and they found that that could be passed on to their offspring. They also found that how long dogs barked for could also be inherited. So some dogs would bark more quickly and bark longer. Some dogs would bark quickly and it would fade out. Not that it's necessarily inherited territorial behaviour, but we do need to understand that there's a complex interplay between instinct and inheritance, and that can also factor into how our dogs behave in the home. So how would you know if your dog is territorial? So the first thing that you would need to understand is that simple stranger danger could be also playing a role in your dog's behaviour. Like I said, Heston, he's not a fan of people he doesn't know. He's a big fan of dogs that he does know. So we have got a little bit of fear there sometimes, a little bit of frustration on work, but I see a strong difference between how he behaves on home turf and how he behaves out on a walk. So he goes from being shy and nervous, for instance, to a very confident get off my land or holding somebody in position so that they can't escape until the guardian comes and <laughs> retrieves the dog so that that person can actually get off the, the land. So there, the difference between this behaviour on home turf and on walks, that shouldn't be as a result of the dog being shut down and too fearful on walks. So most of the time on walks, if Heston's not encountering people or other dogs, he's a fairly confident dog. Well, not fairly confident, he's very confident. He's in his element, he's exploring things, smelling things, you know, everything is fun, everything is wonderful, he loves his walks. So he's not shut down on walks. Um, and what we see in the home is that we get a very different behaviour, much more noisy. And we also need to understand the role that our own behaviour is playing. So, for instance, when that, if I'm not at home, Heston barks much less. So one way to verify this is through video. But it is enough to keep strangers away. So his behaviour is very often about alerting me, particularly, and the rest of us to things he thinks that we need to know about. So just like the livestock guardian dogs will alert the whole flock to the presence of a wolf. So in other words, he barks more when I'm home because that behaviour is just a little bit about me too. And you'll notice I may be done, a, I don't know how many hours of recordings I've done in the last year, maybe 100, 200 hours of recordings. And I very rarely have to stop because my dogs are barking at things outside, even when there's lots of things barking, because unfortunately my attention is playing quite a big role in their behaviour. As you saw with all the lovely photos of all my lovely shepherds, a half quart spaniel who did that too, lying in doorways, territorial dogs may seek a perch or a place that they can see the rest of the world from. So this might be gateways or doorways, but it could be the back of couches or windows, it could be at the top of a hill. Quite a lot of street dogs tend to sleep on top of things as well where they've got a good vantage point. So this is different than anxious dogs who are worried that you're going to leave. So some dogs who will sleep in doorways, Flicker was one of those, to see whether you were going to go out of the house or not. Um, or dogs who don't trust us, for instance, they sometimes lie in places where our movements can't go unnoticed. But this is different from the kind of behaviour we, we might get from a territorial dog whose behaviour is kind of like your name's not down, you're not coming in behaviour. You know, they're very much looking outwards, not inwards. With dogs who are strongly territorial, you will find that they struggle with guests or visitors to the home, but less so if they visit other people's homes. So Heston is a gentleman when we visit other people's homes, for example. Of course, if they're also fearful of people, you might not see that to the same degree. 
if you've got a dog who struggles on home turf, management and training are going to be really important because a significant number of bites to postal workers, delivery people, also to guests, they often happen in entrance ways. And the reasons why they happen in entrance ways are complex, but the heightened emotion of a stranger arriving onto home turf is particularly significant for these dogs. So you may also find alarm barking, which is a response to any intruder who threatens to enter. Uh, postmen, you know, they're always trying to get into your house uh, rather than it being behaviour to alert the family, for instance. So there's a difference between Hessen's barking, which is very much to get my attention, and Tilly's barking, which was very much in response to being scared of stuff. So unlike alert barking, alarm barking is driven, uh, alert barking is driven by consequence often, such as the intruders going away is one of those consequences, or alerting the guardian is another of those consequences. Alarm barking is a panicked response so it can take a dog a very long time to calm down if they're actually alarm barking rather than alert barking. Alarm barkers aren't usually looking for intruders but often both types of dogs don't feel particularly safe on home ground. Although we won't be talking about solutions to your dog's territorial issues here, it's way beyond the scope of this video, I will say that management is very important as is making sure that your dog gets good rest during the day. I will be sharing a video of my alarm and alert barking protocol shortly and you may find that that helps a great deal, certainly help my dogs calm down and you can see the difference of course when we're moving from different area to area. So there you have all of the different reasons why dogs might be territorial, it's partly sometimes from instinct, they are animals and they are part of the canid family and we also also see that that behaviour is very different than the kind of behaviour we would be expecting on walks. It's certainly much more heightened, much more dramatic behaviour when the dog is on, on home turf. And we simply don't know enough from research, but we can imagine and when we're looking at the dogs in front of us, we certainly see that behaviour coming out there. So next time in the video, we're going to be looking at another video where I'm going to be getting out all my protection sports videos once again, because we're going to look at protection. So join us next time and make sure if you're interested in these videos that hit subscribe too. Thanks for joining us.